much, Khan Bolgu Arai. Next, we're going to move on to our next um, speaker uh, now. Um, and it will be William McElhenney. Um, is that Bon and Fubble, eh, William? Um, uh, in the now, or Bon and Fubble, no, my villa came here at my villa. No, I have to say my villa now because of Paddy. I think August Tashi Mar Bonnehor Den Hulacht Wild Strands. He is um, the um, founder of Wild Strands Company and has presented widely on the topic of Irish food culture, particularly on forgotten food, the forgotten foods of Ireland, and especially um, on seaweed, and goes round and delivers educational we wellness and tourism packages um, as, a marine, as a marine explorer um, and work, currently works for Leave No Trace, along with being a Tai Chi instructor and a heritage in schools expert. Um, and Wild Strands is currently um, a lead partner in delivering Stories of Change, which is funded by the um, Creative Ireland um, to address climate change. Um, by William Iglorch for Bia Culture and Heron and you, he will be speaking about Irish food culture today. So we've had Kyol tradition to, we've had traditional Irish music, August and Nish Tamajigal Lorch for Bia Culture and Heron. Um, and now we're going to be sp speaking about the uh, food culture of Ireland. Um, August Kehime Ra, Dirchme Ig Tus, and I'm actually sure I said at the beginning of this occasion, Guru Chonker Ig Gakdanya Igta Ig Lorch in you. Uh, there's everyone has had an influence on me um who is presented today but in particular kahimera and farsha um in that great demo heal in every aspect of my life but in particular um my my journey through irish and my look for my love for the irish language and culture i think a lot of it can be um a lot of the credit can be given to this to this man who's going to present now. So, without further ado, um, but while I'm falling for Rev William, tell me how I can my um pin if I can find him on my screen, and then he's going to also share screen. So, um, Daddy Nertaturi has found your last skyline or inch. August um Arish, as I said, you can um. You can ask questions at the end or throughout. Just put questions into the chat box. Um, my who, Gurmai, good? Hey, Dave. Um, ta Alison Dawn, or um, to be to be uh, a catch for being you. Um, Tashi Inta Tawa da Emosil. Uh, was um, Chani Mo Moskim. This is my story. Um, it's a story of a, a young man growing up. Um, we heard the very elegant Paddy um, talking about the great culture that's in um, any show. And this is a little part of my story. How um, through the years I've I've dabbled in various things, and at this part of my life I'm I'm going back into education, into schools. Um, the ages is very important to me. Um, so to go into schools as a marine explorer and as a um, through the heritage in schools, I get to pass on some of the knowledge that was passed on to me. I also feel that um, in Irish culture, food is just a conversation that's beginning. It's a conversation that I think, especially when I was growing up, um, in the in the seventies and eighties, that um, the food was was waning, and I and I got to hold on to some of them great traditions, but a lot of new foods came in. I can remember the first pasta dish, the first rice dish I had, and these these foods like like pizza and everything else and curries, um, were, were just really being introduced in, and so as I got older, I I. I I developed a yearning to try and understand what is, or is there a food culture? And um, I've been very excited in that journey. And uh, I hope this is a little journey that I can share with you. And that you'll have some understanding of, like Relching, some of the influences that I had on this journey. So, Shani, and Grantor, the Mawami. So, 
Ta Moami is was the biggest influence on me. And um, she did some great things. One of them probably wasn't to teach me how to um, to use this whisk, which is uh, which is an art form, um, especially when my mom was such a great baker. Um, it was when I was mick whisk, whisking um, the eggs, um, and when I, I got the shape of an eight, was I allowed to stop? So it was really at my mom's table in the, in the kitchen. And we used to have an old scullery where we kept stuff cold, especially where she kept um, the milk, which you like to sour, which was, of course, essential for her bread making. But really, it's, it's a tradition that you can't really, especially in a creative form like, like food, I think now we, we look to apps and we look to recipes, but really the food should be all about an experience. Everybody, everybody has an association with food. It's how a lot of things, especially in our house, um, over the years have got solved around the kitchen table. It's where we come together. It's where we can sort out things. So I believe that food, this conversation, this new conversation, almost that the world is having around the price of food, I'd like to talk more about the value of food, the value of food to us and that yearning for a smell, and that yearning for a taste that brings us right back to our childhood. So for me, um, Renu me aran, say je lemo lemo mami. And as I was doing this, um, my mom had no measurements. So I can thank mom when everybody asked me, please tell me the exact ingredients. Well, my mom's to blame. <laughs> I'm delighted for it because when she made her scones. The only measurement she had was a cup that she kept for baking, the scone with. And as she was doing it, it was through touch, it was through feel, when she felt that the scone was ready. And I learned that. I learned to have that patience and that understanding that most things to do with food is alive. And therefore, the same ingredients doesn't always work. Flour is special. Flour. It all depends on the, on the moisture that's in the air as to the moisture that will go in to making a good loaf of bread. But this was something that I found particularly interesting because that was the only type of bread that my mum would make. Smaller scones, of course. I, as I got older, started to become interested in, in other foods around bread that I'd tasted, things like sourdough. And I questioned, why was that not in my diet going? And then I understood the wonderful climate that we have in Ireland and the fabulous, fabulous wheat that, that can be grown. Unfortunately, because we don't get, we get a little bit too much liquid sunshine, but not enough sunshine. So therefore the protein can't develop and therefore the gluten is low. So therefore a lot of the sourdoughs whereby you use a thing called the muller, which is, which is basically just water and yeast, which is fermented. So that is a journey, as you can see in the left-hand side, that is something that I have gone particularly interested in. A very ancient bread because soda bread, although most people think is something that is very much part of Irish food and our culture. Really hasn't been around much longer than 150 years. In fact, I think it came from um, America through the Native Americans. So soda has not been around for that long, but um, the sourdough has from Roman times. 
so for me, when I was growing up, we had a lot of simple soups. And therefore, over the years, I got to realize the taste, the wonderful taste of when, especially my Uncle Jim, we had a fabulous garden. And we so looked forward to his new potatoes, his amazing strawberries. If anybody knew when they were growing up, Red Castle Amusements, we would collect maybe 17 pounds of fresh strawberries. And then with the profit my Uncle Jim made, we spent it all on the amusements. Great connection with fun and food. But these little simple dishes of just, as you can see, heritage of potatoes, some local herbs, barley, and then lentils. These are all things that, things that, you know, from Normans would have given us the lentils and pulses and peas. But overall, as we were growing up, we did not end like what the, the Chinese, Japanese do. Dashi, these amazing sips and broths, all containing seeds. And I wondered, why? Are we not putting seaweed into our food? So I started on a journey of reintroducing seaweed into my diet. This is channel rack. It's one of the, the rack, racks that's kind of got a and come we when it's when it's when it's wet, but it's one of the first racks that you'll come across on the shore, on the upper shore. It'll be hanging like a claw, tightly, dark just waiting for the tide to come in again so it can hydrate and you'll see either it's golden hue or it's brown as a rack. This here small little seaweed is called Indulaman, just one of its great Irish names. And of course, I was very, I'm very lucky. I can see his house from here, from where I live in Mossy Glen in Kennego. Um, Saoirse O'Doherty. It was him on a beach that he was looking through some very old scripts of music where he came across the now famous song and Dulaman, and Dulaman Le Benyubi. Um, he brought it up. Um, it's from West Donegal, and of course, members of Clonard was in the pub, and um, they loved the song. And like all things in, in, in the Irish, in the Irish way, and as part of our culture, it was passed on. So this music, this song became famous and traveled all around the world. Just from an old script. And then Dulaman tells a story about, about travels, travelers that used it for weaving and clothes, for dyes. So famine has been used for many, many, many generations. In fact, right back to nearly um, pre-Christian times, and just in the beginning centuries, um, there's, there's, there's records of seaweed being in our diets. Uh, and therefore it's very much part of the tradition of Irish culture. And I'm so excited that some leading figures in the culinary scene in Ireland are now incorporating seaweed through their dishes. So, but for me, my journey with seaweed, although I was treated to um, a few um, bits of dulse, they were ubiquitous, they were in every shop, these little brown bags containing dulse. It was really only through my father-in-law, John Edward Logue, on the Strand, the White Strand, in front of his house, that John Eddy brought me as a young man, just starting to court, as I'd say now, my, my girlfriend and my wife now, Trish. Um, he brought me down to the shores. And here he is collecting the dry dust traditionally dried on the pebbles 
on the top part of the shore. Very arduous job collecting the dust. It was even more arduous because John Eddy protected an age old, an age old respect for his neighbors and for his area as the beach in front of his house was divided, just like the, the Turbury rights um, and the hills in relation to turf, so too was the beach divided. It was a very important socioeconomic part of coastal life um, in Donegal and throughout the west, the west of, of all of Ireland. Um, it was a place where people had a real connection to using what was local, not out of any necessity, but out of a way of life, a way of life that they were very proud of. And this was something that was very, very exciting to me. I thought it quite fascinating that something could be brought from the sea and dried and kept and stored. And it became more fascinating as time went on when I realized when I read scientific journals that this was now becoming a trend, superfood, to such an extent that Dulce is known as, as vegan bacon. I probably wouldn't go that far, but if that's what trends do, they conjure up words and phrases to make people believe that this is something, I don't know what vegan bacon is, but for me, dulce or dulisk, is my name, I am much dulisk, ac is far than crackna. So dulisk here is on the left, dulce, dulce when it's wet, and then it turns a dark purple, almost black when it's dried. Traditionally eaten, stored in paper bags, or as you saw with my father not in an onion bag. And then this, this almost salty taste of the ocean you would chew on. Surprisingly, I learned later that seaweed has not got a lot of, um, although it's got quite a lot of salty taste, there's high amounts of potassium. And particularly dulce is supposed to be very good for your heart. But this word krachna, this was um, this is in the far right. You may make out the dulce is very dark black. And you'll see small little shells in it, little muscles. And these muscles were the bane of a lot of people because a lot of people loved this sweet krachna. And they would go to extremes. In other words, they'd go out in a boat. Sometimes they were in the more secluded places. But they were sweeter, tastier. Just like my Uncle Jam would know, different people, Mavel's produce, just by the land and how they cared for them. It was the same in the ocean, a different taste from different parts of the ocean. Just like oysters. I lived beside the Foyle Hotel, or beside the Foyle, Foyle River, and it was only when I grew older, I realized that it was one of the largest native oyster beds in Europe. And yet, it was only until I was an adult that I get the opportunity to taste a native oyster. So the taste, the taste of the ocean, the sweet taste is something that I now yearn for. It's something that I enjoy and I enjoy explaining to people where the dolls came from. As I said about my father-in-law, he respected his neighbors. The sweeter dolls was on a neighbor's patch on the beach. So he never showed me that patch. He would always go back to the beach and say, I forgot something and then go out and pick the dolls. His neighbor was long, had long given up the tradition of, of, of gathering any seaweed in the beach. But out of respect, he never showed me where the dulce was. I only discovered the sweeter dulce when one time I took a camera crew out there and I walked on the other side of the beach to discover the sweet dulce. And I smiled to myself. So 
the place in Kionwan, most northerly part of Ireland, this on the right was my wife's grandmother, Bridget. And this was the last time our house was thatched. And this is the time where Tashi Nam, Tashi Nam, Don Cup and Tea of the Sauce, time to have a big rest. And you saw just with the just a few basic things. There was just bread, good butter, and a cup of tea. And then the men got back to work. Again, just like what Patty said, this was done like a mayhem. That is two cousins and a neighbor. That was the way that things traditionally was done, just like the turf sack in the background. That's how it was brought in with neighbors and with cousins. So for me, when I first went out with my father-in-law, I collected the seaweed called Carrigan moss. However, I did not know it as Carrigan moss, as my father-in-law called it. It's time to gather the crottle. I believe crottle is as a derivation with moss. Crottle fascinated me when I went out to collect it. Is this little red seaweed that had bright, almost bright, sparkly nights coming in? This iridescent little seaweed that sparkled in the water. I learned, of course, as I was growing up, that if I ever had a cold or a flu, I'd be given this a concoction of milk um, with this substance, carrigan moss. Again, only to learn the carrigan moss, what an amazing bounty of minerals and of course antiviral and bacterial means, which meant that just like what our forebears, forebears knew, they knew that by consuming carrigan moss, especially when you're feeling weak or cold, it would help relieve any kind of pain. And so in my cafe, I created a dish in honor of this called crop flummery. And there it is on the right. It was a, it was a milk pudding of which um, I made a flummery out of it, which is again, almost like a fermented oat, fermented oat. And I mixed with eggs and with milk. Of course, dairy produce is intrinsic. Um, to the whole story of food and Ireland. But in Wild Strands Cafe, I devised that I would stick only with food that inspired me, a real connection with her past. And therefore, on the stone floor in a wood fired oven, I created a bread, a fermented bed, a sourdough, a bread that I believe that are ancient our ancient ancestors could have made on a griddle, on an open fire, on a flagstone. The simple bread contained barley, rye, oats, and local flowers. And on it here, I was able to find local, local curds, of which curds and cheeses was very much part of an ancient tradition, all but disappeared in the 20th century. But thankfully, three artisans from Cork and cheese now is one of a growing and exciting part of food culture in Ireland. And I was also able to use one of the first Donegal cheeses on the market um, from West Donegal um, in a dish that I made with a cheese sauce with carrigan moss. I also on here put on lamb. And I put on lamb with carrigan moss, along with um, a special spice band that I would do with a lot of a lot of my food to add flavor and to tenderize the meat. And so also, I didn't always do all savory things. Here on the left, as Paddy mentioned, here is slavic, ta slavic inta ishaklic. It is that good in, in chocolate that I reduced, and I'm sure Relchin may even jump in and say 
she saw it with her own eyes. I reduced a few women to tears when they tasted chocolate. That's the difference between men and women. But anyhow, so this Nori, this Slava, this Porfiria along the beach was collected after um, January when there was cold after a good hard frost. And it is full of protein. People knew to take it, you know, a good two batches of it. Um, um, and it would do you, it would get you through, it would get you through the winter. But anybody that came into my cafe were just more than happy to get a little bit of wildness through the brownie. I was also true to um, when I cooked, I loved the story, the connections, the importance of beef. So, Shaw Bia Bunea, or Coulter in the Heron. It's, it's an amazing um, part of our of our heritage, the story of beef, right back into the legends of a mouton and the bull, or the bull of Cooley. But it wasn't eaten a lot. We allegedly had be a buck. Allegedly, I say, because I think most people, when they gathered locally and when they ate locally and the wild animals they caught from boar, and of course that tradition means that pig is still a very popular thing in Ireland. But beef, I treated it with respect. And I went back to the ancient practice of cooking down the seaweed, which was done. And when that was done, it went into, I, I grinded it, it was smashed. And this is where the original beef was preserved. This preserving of beef, of course, traveled through wars as it became part of corned beef. I, of course, cooked it slowly and didn't turn it into corned beef, but made my own spice mixed with it. So I, I realize the time is just pushing me by, isn't it, Relching? So I'm just going to skip through a few things. Um, I'm, I'm looking here at my fish soup, my brie skink. Brie, of course, and skink was a combination of two things. It was usually to do with broth cooking, cooking uh, with milk and onion, but the brie would have come from barnacles, barnyards. As I bring out kids and delighted in my local area, they always confuse the limpets with the barnyards, with the barnacles. The barnacles are the little small shells in the rocks, whereas traditionally um, the limpets, in Irish of course, was called barnyards. So there's another confusion when the English came along. So the limpets were, were a flavor in the fish soup, in this broth. But for me, I, I smoked dulse, and therefore I made a broth with various different types of seaweed. Um, and I didn't follow what most cafes or restaurants did in creating the charity. It's true to, it's true to who I believe it was. And so here is important the Kyung Mon. Mon head seems to be noted for the taste of the crab. When I grew up, I was treated all the time from boats coming, up, coming into Greencastle, where friends and neighbors, people like John Cromish would, would throw in, as they would say, as we would say, throw in a bag full of crab claws. And here I have cooked it in a pancake, which it was known and was traditionally eaten from the potato um, called box day, a mixture of a mixture of raw and cooked potato. And so as we go on, I like to think that when we when a lot of people come to Ireland and say, we don't have a tradition of the coast, here is a cork, a cork, a cork. Um, here I am, a togo cork, um, a very simple boat, a simple boat that's been around for millennia. And um, it shows that 
people around Ireland through the skin of animals and through the basics of the hazel that they, that they found around were able to, to make this boat and travel. So I realize my time is nearly up. So I'm just going to show you a few things where I've been involved in other boats like the Green Castle Yawl. Again, tradition, one of the oldest boat builders, Brian McDonald there, of a family going back over 300 years. So Tamisha Igiha is probably one of the most important things I enjoy doing. August, August through Bia. Um, it's it's great to meet people. Okay, so to go row Mila Mahel August August um I'm all in cash August Major Nero um there's no time. No, be I'm again. We'll have a few, we'll have time for a few questions. Go Mila Mahel August um as of chin um as of chin um i'm just looking in the chat box here to see if there's any questions if not um anyone can raise their hand and we'll john i'm okay stuggart yeah bail team yeah go for it, john yeah talk to um i i can't get a picture can, can you hear me okay yeah i can hear you yeah okay because i'm getting an echo on my speaker at any rate uh, go to Mil Mahabut, William. I thoroughly enjoyed your talk and made a couple of big connections. We have a funny family story when you talked about measurements and how in, in former, former days they didn't have measuring cups and measuring spoons. And my, my mother used to make fantastic bread that we all could smell out in the yard when we were playing, would all come in to get some pot out of the oven. But my sister Betty asked my mother to give her the recipe to what we called Irish bread. And so she got a notepad and a pencil and my mother started making the bread and she said, now you put a fistful of this and Betty would say, well, wait, wait, what's a, what's a fistful? And my mother would say, what's well, a fistful? That's, it's your hand. <laughs> and then she continued and said, now you put a pinch of, a pinch of this. And Betty would say, well, well, what's a pinch? How much is a pinch? Well, this, this went on, the whole family was gathered around this. It was like one of the co cooking shows. It was really funny. And eventually she made the bread and it was terrible. <laughs> but anyhow, it's it's a funny family story that has been handed down for the last 60 years. But thanks very much. I thoroughly enjoyed your whole presentation. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Relching, you're on mute. Yeah, any other questions? I can't see anything. I think we're all good. Nope. Um, oh, Sorry. Here. are any seaweed types becoming endangered by pollution or climate change? Well, um, yes, um, there is a lot of, pro there's a lot of issues maybe in the ocean. And um, some of the microalgae, plankton, um, a lot of people are becoming aware of that, especially through reef development, um, as they have a symbiotic relationship with the development of the coral reef. And as the waters get too warm, they're effectively spat out. And it's a thing called coral bleaching. But also um, in terms of the seaweeds that we can see, Yes, there is an issue with um, more dominant invasive species arriving in different parts of the coast, things like sargassum, and also things like wakame or wakami. So as, as any invasive species comes in, they can um, dominate um, a habitat. So we have to become aware of them. Very good. 
hope that answered your question. August, yes, Beth, and I can attest to the chocolate. Everyone knows that I love chocolate and so does Beth. So, yep, <laughs> I can confirm. Um, does dulsk mean something of fish? Dulsk is another word for dulse in Irish. Dulsk is a word for dulse. Mike, I can answer that. I don't know if you want to add to that, Mr. Yeah, I'm not. I don't know if it has a connotation with um with fish. Um, I, I I don't know that to be honest. Dulsk is the word for dulse in Irish. Um, the background behind it, um, I actually don't know. I don't know if Pat Patty would be able to jump in there, or maybe our next speaker might be able to answer that question. <laughs> and one other question: Are there any um? seaweeds that you use that can be found on this side of the Atlantic? Yeah, sorry. Um, like things like Carrigan Moss, of course, the uh, main company up along the coast of America. Yeah, they, they, they had a huge industry um, to such an extent that, um, that um, they used rakes and, and, and possibly got over, we were overzealous. <laughs> and if they, we were overzealous, um, Unfortunately, the carrigan moss didn't grow back. It's how to sustainably harvest. Um, but yes, a lot of the kelps um, um, are eaten and grown, especially around the North Coast. Um, but again, um, I think there's um, different licensing because of, um, again, possibly pollution, again, possibly because of local, local legis legislation in, in different areas. Um, so therefore, I'd watch out, but yeah, there's so many different varieties um, from kelps, especially, but also carrigan moss grows um, quite abundantly over there. But you've got the ulvas and things like sea lettuce and all of these things, they all grow there. So, yeah, get a foraging book from around <laughs> North America. Oh, well, very interesting. Thank you. Okay. Gurumaya Gubakar Jitnil, I'm a BL again for your question. We have no more time for questions. We've kind of gone over a bit there already, but Gurumila um, Mayagat, the William August, obviously, well, not obviously, but Moyaji Foster. So Gurumila Mila Mayagat, Ashan. 